We are many. Dreamers brimming with hope. We are one. A choir. Singing as though every desperate breath could be our last. We are believers. Makers. The spitting image of our Father. We are dust. Dirt. Clay in the potter's hands. We are still. We are small. We are the meek. We are those who mourn. We are the blessed, but we are sinners. Playing God, we are wrong. We are sorry. We are forgiven. We are saved. We are saints. We are at war. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Our enemy divides us. He stands over the broken and colorful pieces of our shattered remains, holding the very bricks we've thrown through our own windows in his hands. But he hasn't won, and we won't give him the satisfaction. No, we are rebels. We are the underdogs, revived in the thrill of our king's victorious return. A moment in which we are reunited, reassembled pieces of stained glass, a window into a better world. We are standing tall, standing on the shoulders of giants. We are brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, prodigals, prophets and priests. We are a family. We are of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every age. We are the body of the great I am. We are different. We are the same. We are many, but we are one in Christ. In Him, we are undivided. We are the City Harmonic. Sing It, it, with the problem with steel now not being part of the business here, all the other companies are losing out too. They don't have the product to make their product. In 1981, there was over 13,500 employees working in this plant alone, which is a thousand acres of one piece of land. Today, you have approximately about 1,500 people working there. Uh, quite a difference, uh, and it's affected the whole city. We have initiated several actions and projects that I would like to discuss now. Some that will have an impact in the near term and some that will require some additional time for us to realize our full benefits. We have decided to permanently shut down the iron and steel making operations at Hamilton Works on December 31st, 2013. Decisions like this are always difficult, but they are necessary to improve the cost structure of our Canadian operations. Usually I say like Hamilton is a, a place that I sort of have a love-hate relationship with. I moved here when I was 15 and so as steel dried up, I was just coming, just moving here with my family. We came for a visit uh, to Hamilton in 1998 and uh, we, we went back to Texas, back home, uh, saying that it was, seemed like a very dark place, a city that um, was down on itself, down on its luck and not a place anybody was happy to be. Uh, nothing, nothing ever happens in Hamilton. 
That was pretty much the attitude that we heard. It's an interesting place to grow up in because the question of identity is almost always present. You've got a ton of immigrants, you've got a lot of people who've been here a very long time and have ideas about the city, that about what it is, that steel town blue collar thing that is rapidly changing. You know, you, the, the steel industry here is, is gone. 60% of the steel produced in Canada was made in Hamilton, 60%. The majority of the steel made in the country was produced right here. In the 80s, my dad was telling me that you could just walk down there and walk into any factory, just get a job, just like that. Like, and now it's all but dried up. I mean, those, those companies have moved on. They've, they've really uh, abandoned the city. There's certain parts of the city that, especially growing up, you, you wouldn't want to go to, or your parents wouldn't, you, wouldn't want you to go to. You, you can't ignore the impact of the steel industry and, and the way things changed. But uh, it was more than just the steel industry. The, you had a lot of other companies that uh, disappeared and, and or were broken up, and we just didn't replace them during the 60s and 70s, and, and that, uh, I think that's what led to the downturn. We were unable to replace not just the steel industry, but the Westinghouses and the Firestones and International Harvester, and there were a whole bunch of other. I mean, Procter & Gamble had a major operation in Hamilton. And, uh, these things all disappeared. It, it's a cumulative effect of a lot of different things. My dad's a pastor, and so he was just sort of on the, on the search for a church. Um, and we came from a city in Texas that was 80% churched. And uh, when we came across Hamilton, and he was sort of interviewing for the job here, uh, we came up and spent a week here uh, and found out that Hamilton at the time was less than 20% churched. So it became this very clear op you know, mission field in his mind. And, and slowly, as, as, as um, part of the family, I realized that we were moving up here somewhat as missionaries. As the steel industry collapsed, you just end up having a lot of poverty, you know, and systematic poverty, where people are used to working and being very blue-collar families, and now the major employer of the city is finished. Uh, so that led to a lot of the complications that we're still wrestling with in Hamilton. You know, how do you do, um, how do you give job opportunities to people? How do you help people uh, recover from that kind of job loss? And how do you empower people to change their neighborhoods? Most of my childhood was downtown, and then as a teenager, I was up on the mountain, you know, that divide that sort of divides the city. And it's interesting, I think of like the mountain almost as like the perfect description for Hamilton. You've got this sense of this urban, blue collar thing that wants to kind of have its own identity and has often struggled with poverty and all these things. And then you've got this whole other group of people that kind of want it to be something else. <laughs> <laughs> there's this, there's these two groups that are di almost divided by geography in a sense. Being raised on top of the escarpment, the upper mountain area of the city was a spot where you could hang out and see your friends and you know spend your time. But the lower city was just a place you did not go. Like you take like, you would take a trip to downtown Hamilton like you were taking a trip to Toronto, which is an hour away, you know? It was just considered a different city altogether. And for a lot of my life, there was this vibe of you just don't go down there if you can ever avoid it. It's a very diverse city. There are these two worlds that sort of exist, the green world that's lush and beautiful and, and, and incredible, and then also this sort of old steel world that is sort of broken down and rusting out but they're both beautiful in their own way. Most of the city is tree covered, so we were just dumbstruck by how beautiful it was and shocked by how uh, poorly uh, Hamiltonians felt about themselves. I'd say there was a real sense of um, kind of living in reaction and you know, Hamilton uh, knew uh, yeah, kind of had a sense of what it wasn't, but didn't always have a clear sense of what it was. The culture here is very post-Christian. It's very, um, it's all about tolerance. Society is all about tolerating the other's view. And it's very unpopular to be religious, um, or particularly Christian. The spiritually dark place that we sensed um, was so striking that when I talked and met other pastors in town, they, um, they were discouraged about the lack of vibrant churches. 
And I said, well, you know, what if somebody comes to this church uh, where I'm now pastoring as a new pastor here uh, and they don't fit, where do, I, where do I send them? At first I didn't believe it, but after a while I realized, yeah, the churches here are just as dead as the economy is. Son of God for man to die Even then I know you knew my name Jesus My dad, um, I remember just hearing him talk about trying to network with other local pastors and connect with them in, a, in, a, in just a general way. There was no real agenda to it, except to like make connections and see what happens. Eventually, it, it sort of formed into this sort of loose network of churches who the pastors were all friends and they gotten to know each other a little bit and they shared a passion for seeing the city changed. The downtown core has sort of seen a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache and um, it, it just need, it needs revitalization, it needs the love of Jesus. And so eventually that, that network became a little bit more of a, a solidified thing under the banner called True City. Partly what drove the True City movement in the beginning was the recognition that a group of us had met previously, predominantly just to gather, to discuss, and to talk and to pray, but no action steps were ever taken. And we realized that in this new emerging movement, there would be things that we'd have to do together. From the beginning, there was, there was vision for uh, how do we make these churches that are involved stronger in engaging the communities around them. So I, I'd say that dream was there from the beginning. Um, the second year that these churches were together, we started to say, well, what are the core values of this thing? So the theological statement we gathered from international teams and the core values we set up together and said, with these things being true of us, we can now work together, regardless of some of the things that we don't see eye to eye on. We began to just decide, how do we go about blessing a city? And what can we do together that we could never do in our individual isolated congregations across the city? The central passage that forms the sort of the theme, the heartbeat of the True City Movement is Jeremiah 29. In some ways, it's very similar to, uh, to our situation here in, in Canada generally, and certainly in Hamilton. Um, so Jeremiah, God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet to Israel in exile, Judah in exile, um, said, you know, the, you have false prophets and they're telling you, fight Babylon, revolt, run back to Jerusalem. And God's message to Israel in spite of that was, don't do that, you're here for a time. I've measured the days, and while you're here, you seek the good, the peace, the shalom of the city. You buy houses, you build houses, you marry your daughters off, you have children and grandchildren, you do what you are called to do here. God's call for us as Christians in the city is to make sure that we are loving the city, that we are investing in the city, and through our lives and our prayers and our hard work, we are blessing the city. That's our slogan, uh, together, churches together for the good of the city. There was this movement called Cross Culture, which was, Eli had a huge hand in planning. He was kind of the, one of the first uh, architects of that, 
that event. And what it was is a few times a year, students from across the, uh, the city, high school students, college students, would get together. We'd have a bit of a worship time, musical worship time in the morning, and then we'd do service projects all over the city. The idea that churches needed to get together to do something about this was kind of amazing to me. And so I started to work with a couple students and student leaders and youth pastors from different parts of the city and Redeemer University and different churches and saying, well, what if we could get people together and kind of actually like worship together as, a, as the church, you know, being from different churches, but then also serve our community and do mission. And so that's what we did. We'd get together and we'd, we'd go out and serve and do missions projects all day all over the city. But then we'd get together at night and have a big worship concert. And that's sort of, at first, sort of why we pulled the band together from different places, just friends who knew each other and went to different churches who tried to figure out how to do this thing. Word of God, God from the start, recreating human hearts, make us like the moon at night. The big impact of the True City movement on the city is mostly that the city leaders are now listening to True City. Our concerns are always about people, not necessarily giving people money, but coming alongside them. Uh, when you just give people money, you demean them. You make them dependent on you for more money. But when you walk with them, you encourage their spirit. In other words, now they have hope for the future because they have a friend or a bunch of friends that they, that they hadn't had before. So the main impact on the city uh, of True City has been personal. What churches are really good at is relating to people. Uh, and we're not great at being experts on some area of, of mission, but we're great at being the people who take some of this expertise and actually live it out on the ground um, life on life with people in our neighborhoods. We can make a difference uh, uh, more authentically that way. There are more than 300 social agencies in the, in the downtown, 300 agencies. And most of them would recognize the, the True City label. And many of them have listened to us. So that's had a huge impact. Some of the ways True City has been a blessing has been churches and congregations have been able to actually learn from each other. As we've watched one church engage its neighborhood, another church has come alongside to see what that church has done and model some of the things that each congregation is doing after each other. So we found strength and to be able to learn from each other. Initially for me, it was a really interesting experience. At the time I was the only woman who ever went to the gatherings and uh, it, it was pastors connecting and we were talking about how to be more missional as churches. So pastors kind of holding each other accountable was how it began for us. And looking at our job descriptions and saying, you know, is there space in your job description to be missional and to be engaged in your community and how is that connected to how you'll serve as a pastor? And it was an interesting experience for me because I was working with these pastors that had some pretty significant different theological stances on who could be in ministry. They didn't, they, their churches wouldn't have ordained women. So I went with my backup initially a bit, expecting maybe not to be taken seriously or respected, or, you know, how is this gonna look? These people that kind of do some of their church practices different than me. Um, whereas from the beginning, it was just an incredible experience. So my wife and I knew from a pretty young age that we were feeling called to something in downtown Hamilton around congregation, around church and parish. And we said, hey, we have this idea for a church plant. 
do we need another church in the city? And if so, what would it look like? And who would it connect with? And what kind of neighborhoods would it involve itself in? And we threw all of this out there, and I'm talking like a circle of people that were already pastoring in the city, already involved in churches, and threw it out there thinking they were gonna say like, oh, we've got enough churches, or we want people to go to our church, so don't start anything new. But I was super surprised when they looked back and they said, yeah, that sounds amazing. Like, you guys have to do this. What do you need? I think that the True City movement has a, had a part in enriching the soil that churches are growing in. So, so it, it's just become natural for people in congregations involved in True City to, to be aware of what's happening in other, other congregations. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's just become more common. And then people hear about it not being common in other places and they're surprised by that which to me is a great sign. That, that to me is a clear indication of the fact that, that True Cities had this influence is when people are surprised hearing the stories from other cities that, that churches don't work together. If I'm poor as dirt and left with empty hands I am still rich beyond my dreams Cause all the other ground is sinking sand Yes, I got everything I need I'd talk to other church planters in the other cities and they'd ask me about it and I'd say, oh, it's incredible. And they'd say, well, what's being like the best thing about it? And I'd say to these friends, oh, the best thing is that all the other churches in the city just totally have our back. You know, they're connecting with us, they're helping us and coaching us. And every month we get together with a group of other church planters and we talk about what that looks like. And they would stop me as I told these stories and they'd be like, what are you talking about? And I'd say like, what do you mean? And they'd go, well, with our church plant in our city, the other churches are the biggest challenge that we're facing. Like they're talking about how we don't have the gospel down enough or how we are on their territory. And there's this violent territorialism that we're facing. And, you know, we just never faced that. For us, it was always, uh, this isn't about one congregation or one group of Christians. This is about the kingdom. This is about every person that is following Jesus, serving their city together. And so, you know, a victory for another church is a victory for our church. Um, if they win, we win, because it's not about each of us individually, it's about what God is doing in all of us. One of the interesting things is that you find yourself, because you're a true city person, <clears throat> what I find myself doing as I meet new people who come into the city, a lot of people are attracted to Hamilton, and coming in and looking for church. I, I actually can just naturally, and with a good heart, mention a church that would fit maybe their bent. Um, if they're a real creative kind of person, you know, there's a great church downtown. But if they're really interested in their neighborhood, where they're gonna live, it's like, well, there's great churches right around you. And I don't find myself thinking about a denomination. I don't find myself thinking um, about owning more people to my church. It's more like, um, no, there are churches that you can find that are active in the city. All, almost all the true, true City churches are neighborhood-focused congregations. Uh, 50 to 75, some of them are that small. And yet the ones that are involved have, over this decade, have grown numerically. Um, so reaching out to your neighborhood is actually good for you. <laughs> it draws more people. And the, the, the big thing is the people who are doing the reaching out, physically and spiritually, are spiritually energized and deepened. Uh, Christians who just sit in the pew and come and go on from Sunday to Sunday tend not to grow spiritually or to mature in many ways except by age. Um, but when you're engaged in, in helping people who are poor and helping people who, to understand the gospel, then your life is transformed and that's what's happened here. True City itself doesn't want to be this massive organization that is 
um, for themselves or promoting themselves. They, they're just trying to get across an idea and, and show the church that this, that this unity thing is, is actually something that works. As a musician going through, uh, going to different countries, seeing different churches, seeing what different Christians do is, is it's not about our own little empires. It's because um, True City doesn't want to be its own little empire. It, that would defeat the whole purpose of it. True City has required that every congregation submit to one another. Uh, it's required that congregations don't focus on growing numerically, but about being faithful and doing the kind of things that Jesus has called us to do. I mean, it's really easy for churches that are following Jesus uh, to start playing the games of the world, but just kind of stamping Jesus on the title of it. So uh, Jesus's way of serving, of losing your life to find it, of um, a revolution from the bottom up, can be really difficult when you've got the structures and the sort of empire building uh, of the Romans. So you've got, you know, and this is nothing against the size of a congregation or the budget of a congregation, but when your spirit is about dominating and being bigger and better, you can't have a city like Hamilton and you can't have a movement like True City. We don't want to grow any of our individual churches unless it's actually the whole kingdom flourishing. And so it sort of stops this anonymous church shopping congregation building empire and uh, really refocuses us on the relationships that undergird the entire movement. It's just one of the most awesome parts of getting to work in Hamilton, getting to be in True City. It's just the greatest joy and honor and it's just such a delight to call such a diverse group of people friends <laughs> and people that I may have otherwise never made an effort to get to know and would have made a lot of assumptions about, and assumptions about how they saw me, and now to see them as partners and uh, peers. And so, I mean, as pastors, the, the support for each other is so huge and the encouragement for each other. And, uh, and that trickles to the churches as well. It's not just a pastor movement, of course, but it's just so neat to work with such an eclectic group and to just feel like we're in it together, right? Like, we're just in it together for the city. There's such a sense that we're all passionate about this and we celebrate everyone's causes for celebrations. And so there's this idea that becoming a follower of Jesus isn't about you being saved for your own good. Uh, it's about you being saved from all your sin and brokenness for the good of others. And so the commitment of the church in Hamilton and the commitment of this movement of churches is becoming more and more about how do we create uh, God's vision for Hamilton. One of the things that I'm seeing and experiencing um, in talking with people in my own community and just people around the city, um, people who are Christian, is this idea of what is happening as people live in certain neighborhoods, that bringing, bringing Jesus' love into those neighborhoods, bringing justice. Um, so what, we, what I've had is sort of transient people in a good way. Um, there'll be people who live up on the mountain and they've got invested in what's going on down in the inner city, um, in the north end of the city. And it just doesn't make sense to them anymore that they're living up on the mountain and they want to be down in the north end of the city, down, down there doing um, their missional work. So uh, you see people now moving down where they want to make a difference and moving into the neighborhood and being there. It's not like, I don't want to do this as a project. I want to live here. There's this art revival um, whose sort of playful mantra is, art is the new steel. You know, steel left Hamilton, wound up really hurting because of it. And now you have this, this, this sort of group of artists that have sprung up in the middle of the city, in the heart of the city, and have started opening up um, all kinds of different businesses and you know, running a, a, a regular um, art crawl, they call it, which is where the sh street shuts down one Friday every, out of every month and it's just art everywhere. And because of that, a lot of, the city, a lot of people are moving in from other cities to sort of be a part of this new movement of art um, and, and be a part of the industry that's sort of being created around that. A lot of the downtown churches especially have been really intentional about getting involved with that, that sort of world. These public art pieces are both a reflection of our congregation, but also sort of a prophetic word to the city. It's a way to talk about issues that matter to the city, to talk about justice and reconciliation and gentrification. 
uh, and consumerism. You know, art can be such a powerful word, um, like a prophetic word that points out the ways that the city is flourishing and the ways that the city is broken. And so uh, it's amazing to see these different churches within the movement, each picking areas that they excel at, be it uh, refugee engagement with new arrivals or small business startups or healthcare or business, uh, to see these churches find what they can do really well and connect people across these congregations so that they partner in the work that God is doing. I mean, that's just, to me, uh, the most beautiful thing that's happening right now in this movement. I see God moving in the city, um, and I feel like there's there are obvious ways that God's kingdom is 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 taking deeper root in in um, neighborhood revitalization and um, creative responses to um, needs of people on the margins in uh, in just. A, real passion for beauty and a recognition of what's good in the city and a, and a growing sense of of, uh, uh, of what Hamilton, is, who Hamilton is, right? So I think people are less likely now to kind of think of Hamilton uh, uh, in terms of what it's not and more in terms of what it is. So I see God working like that and I think True City is the result of God moving in those ways. So I, I, I I much prefer to frame it that way than kind of, well, here's what True City's accomplished in the city, right? Yeah, it, it feels to me like we've had the privilege of being part of, of the spirits moving in, in our context, and um, we're part of people connecting in some ways uh, that, that has allowed for, for good to come to the city, for us to thrive. The City Harmonic is, uh, has, is deeply rooted in Hamilton. Uh, all four band members were, went to high school here, um, are Hamiltonians. Um, so there's a long, long connection uh, for all the bandmates to Hamilton. In fact, the whole name, City Harmonic, is an expression of the true city movement, that it's a resonance with the resonating uh, impact of those true city churches. A lot of our identity kind of came out of this movement, this, this intersection of mission and worship, uh, living in a way that is sacrificial and, and seeking the good of those around us and also in the middle of that and in doing that both through music and just living our lives that way we found worship and mission sort of colliding in a beautiful way. And that became a real big part of who I am and it became a huge part of who the City Harmonic is. At one of the True City conferences, uh, we invited the band uh, to the conference. They, they were in town uh, that weekend and we actually had a commissioning service right here in this room to uh, pray for them and to remind them of their calling and to send them out as representatives of Christ and of 
uh, the church community in Hamilton. A lot of times, especially with worship music, you get a band that comes along and, and they've been leading that congregation in worship. And for us, it was a little different. And, and so they invited all these elders and pastors to come rally around us and lay hands. And in the end, there was like maybe 20 or 30 different churches represented laying hands on us as a band to sort of send us out into the world and, and continue to do what we'd started to do here. To choose one of our churches and to have the elders commission us from one of the churches wouldn't have seemed right. And to have the elders from all these different churches representing each of our denominations and more was just unbelievably amazing. When the City Harmonic goes out on their concerts, on their tours, and promotes the ideas of True City, it's very encouraging to know that that uh, sense of Christian unity, of Christian collaboration, which has never really been true in North America, it's sort of a seed, a meme, that ge that's spreading all over the continent, and certainly the City Harmonic is promoting the idea, and people are catching that. So yeah, it's, it's taking root, and it, the, the concept is spreading. It's sort of quintessentially Hamilton almost, you know, it's, it's not one place, it's not a city, it's like a, a, a context for communities to exist, it's a context for different groups to exist and, and coexist, and I think the way that we kind of came together as a band reflects that. Over these 15 years I've seen sort of the self-image and self-esteem of the city dramatically change, to the point where I don't really hear people saying much they hate the city anymore. Um, the woe is Hamilton, it's kind of faded. I'm not saying it's not said or that I don't hear it, but it used to be the only thing I heard about Hamilton from Hamiltonians, and now it's rare for me to hear that. Uh, the way people talk about Hamilton, um, their love for the city, just this really positive view of Hamilton, um, and just this desire among Christians um, especially among True City churches, just to invest in the city and the number of businesses that have been started and projects and, and community hubs that people have just owned and embraced um, and placed right here in the city. So this passion for Hamilton and this love for it and that Hamilton's actually kind of almost becoming a cool place now. Like it's the shift that, um, you know, there's a greater tendency. People just don't talk about it in the same way. When you grow up somewhere like Hamilton, where it's this kind of blue collar, steel city vibe that's in the middle of a massive transition, I think it's really interesting because for me, it's like this little version of what's going on in culture everywhere, you know? Things are changing rapidly. Having been a Christian here, having belonged to churches here, and seen what happens when churches don't stand opposed to their community, but embrace it and really try to say, hey, what happens if we do, if we give ourselves for this, instead of just trying to take from the community, um, that incredible things can happen. And I think the kind of cultural revival that we see in Hamilton now is, is indicative of that. I wasn't really th ever thinking, Hamilton's the city I want to work in, I want to live in. and. Uh, moved here, worked here, started getting to know the city and fell in love with it. And to the point now, seven years later, I don't ever want to leave this city. I think it's really interesting as we go from one city to another, doesn't matter where you are in the world, there's always a sense of a desire for unity, a desire for being together and standing together, and yet this tension of like, how? What does this look like? You know, we, when we disagree on some things and agree on others. And I, for me, I'm just really grateful that we have the opportunity through music and, and, and worship and coming together as the church, in a sense, for one moment, one glimpse of what it is we're supposed to be, that, that we have the opportunity to really take that home for people, you know? And I'm grateful for that. If we can continue to do that for as long as we can and just help people yeah, I mean, just really help people to, to see that they belong to something bigger than themselves. Like anything and like any community that's changing, you know, uh, it needs to sort of settle on into its identity. You know, it's like, in, in a sense, Hamilton has had several seasons in its life and the church here has had several seasons in its life. And, and now it's a time where I think 
the church here, the community here, it's, it, it's an issue of making decisions, I think. I think the church here, in a good way, has decided that it's better together. And, and, and I guess I really hope and pray that the community can do the same. As we carry this message of ours, of True City with us, of you know, building a kingdom of God as opposed to building our own small kingdoms uh, and being silos unto ourselves, people respond to it. People want that. People in the church crave this sort of idea of being a singular body. Uh, and it's really brilliant. It's really cool to actually talk about you know, these tiny little churches that we have back home that are just banded together to work together, who maybe don't have the resources of a big mega megachurch um, or some of the sort of more sizable churches down, uh, down south or even across Canada. Um, but they're willing to put everything on the line to serve the city. And so it keeps us grounded in a certain way because we come home and we get back involved in our churches as soon as we're able to and find a way to reintegrate and get into, involved with service projects and uh, serve in any way that we can. And it just reminds us why we're doing this. It reminds us with our own t physical hands and feet doing, doing work uh, that God's call on the church is to seek the good of his people. And whether it's a mega church or a local, small, you know, 50, 50 person church, it's all the same call. And we share that in common. That's really been really beautiful to see and, and watch how this sort of worldwide church has come together um, and, and, and respond so fervently and get so excited about the idea of actually being one, actually operating in unity with the church across the world. It's amazing to me what happens when people sing together, when people get together and kind of see that there's a common ground, you know? I mean, that is, I guess, why we wrote Manifesto to begin with, why, in a sense, we took the name we did as a band was just sort of really trying to really trying to encourage the church to see that we are better together than all the divisive stuff that we kind of often lean towards. That if, if we really want not just the world to be a better place, but the world to know about what Jesus has really done for us, then that, in a sense, begins and ends in, in rooms like this where we come together despite our differences and, and recognize that we're a family. True City for, for me has had a really tangible impact as, like, as an individual. It's really kind of shaped the way I see how church is meant to run, how, how the body of Christ works together. Different parts of the body have different, have different gifts and serve different purposes, but we're one body, we work as one. And so this whole theme of church unity has become very clear um, in, in seeing these churches from across the city from very different backgrounds with certain discrepancies according to what they believe doctrinally. But we can say these are the central tenets of our belief. We believe in Jesus. We believe he died and rose again. We can serve and love this city as Jesus loved people while he was here. Seeing the church rally around a cause, not just ideas, you know, a cause and a person of, of Jesus, not just what we think about baptism or something, you know, um, has been pretty incredible, you know, and, and, and as we've traveled, and I think to some degree it's equipped us to, I mean, when you're a traveling worship band, you go from one place to the next and you see very different, very different things from one church to the next, very different sets of values, very different sets of beliefs. And the ability to know what you're about and yet find common ground as family, you know, to see brothers and sisters instead of them. Uh, I think that's something that, that we learned here in a way that I don't know if we could have learned anywhere else.
just one hand.